This is a sermon by Bishop Gregory Brewer on January 5th, 2014 at Christ the King Episcopal Church, Orlando, Florida, beginning with a children's sermon on the Epiphany of the Lord. Where do you all usually gather for the children's time? Up here? How many of you know what this is? What? It is a cane, yes. <laughs> but it also has something funny on the top that most canes don't have. Do you know what this is? Hmm? It's a shepherd's crook. And it's a shepherd's crook that was meant to do a lot of things, to use to be used as a weapon to protect the sheep and to fight against the wolves and to be able to be a comfortable walking stick so when the shepherd was walking in the rocky hills, he wouldn't fall over. But it was also meant to do something else. Let me demonstrate. Would you? <laughs> sheep. What's your name? She's not a sheep. But because sheep, you're smart. Sheep are not very smart. And they have a tendency to wander. And so what a shepherd would do if somebody began to wander, a sheep, start to walk over there. He would go, oh no. <laughs> and he would bring the sheep back. In other words, the shepherd's crook was used to keep sheep close to the shepherd and to draw them back to him. Now, we have something in this story Looks like this. Do you know what this is? Yeah, it's a star. God used the star to draw the wise men to Jesus. It's just as if he will stick. He used this to reach out to these people who lived in other countries. They did not live in Israel and to cause them to draw them and to bring them back to Him. It's a supernatural star. If you read the story, this star does not obey any law in science. There's never been a star like it before or since. But God used that star to bring these people from other countries to finally come and to see Jesus. It was like He was using them to bring them to Him. Now, we don't have, we have lots of stars in the sky, but we don't have any star that does what this star did. As I said, there's never been one like it before or since. But God still wants to use who? People. You and me to bring other people to Jesus. So, oops. Where the star is now is right here. Because you see, you and I, if we are Christians, have the very light of the very star of Christ in our hearts. And God wants to use us to bring other people to Christ in the very same way that He used that star to bring those pagan wise men to come and to kneel at the feet of Jesus. So, here's the lesson. It's a prayer. God, use me so that others will come to know Jesus. Can we say this together phrase by phrase? God, use me to help others to come to know Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You all can go back and sit in. Now, here's the adult portion of the sermon. <laughs> it's still the same message, though. This Feast of the Epiphany is actually, in our day and age, an extraordinarily countercultural festival. If we were to have a gathering, say an interfaith gathering, then we would sing the song that we just sang. You are Lord of creation, Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. We bow down and worship you, Lord. You are King of creation, 
king of my life, it would cause some ruffled feathers. Because what we say in that song, and what we're actually saying in this festival, is that God has done something entirely unique. Never to be repeated in history. That he has chosen to manifest precisely who he is. His exact nature in the form of a human being. It's what we say in the creed. And we don't say this about anybody else. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. All of those phrases are meant to articulate something extraordinarily important. That what God has done in revealing Jesus to the world is unlike anything that we've seen in history, either before or since. That he is the unique and above all other manifestations of God to the world. He is, as it says in John, God made flesh. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten who? Father, meaning God. <laughs> Full of grace and truth. That's what we're celebrating. But not only, to, but that's just Christmas. Isn't there more? Yes, there is more. Because even though that's what we celebrated at Christmas, all of those who gathered at that manger were all what? They were Jews, right? Out your head, you with me? Yeah. But then you have this funny event that Matthew records that through this supernatural star that these who were probably astrologers had never ever seen before, they thought there is something ominous. There is a sign in the sky. And they began to follow the direction of the star. Now, I don't know who's here and who's not, but if you are not from a Jewish background, the very fact that you can say today that you belong to Jesus and that you've given your life to him has everything to do with this story of the wise men. Because this was God's sign to his disciples that Jesus was not just a Messiah for the Jews, but he literally is Messiah, Lord, and King over, the old, over all the earth, that there is no one like him and all of us regardless of our ethnic background or our place in history, are called to come and to worship him. You need to know that that is an astonishing historic occurrence. Prior to that time, religious affiliation was entirely defined by ethnicity, by location, ge geographic location, what your tribe was or your family or, or where you lived so that, for example, I mean, my forebears come from the United Kingdom. If Jesus hadn't come to them, you know what my forebears would be doing? They'd be under the authority of the Druids drinking blood out of a skull. Right? Or if you were a Maasai in Africa, you would be honoring your ancestors. And that would be your form of worship. You would be calling on the local shaman to curse your enemies and to give you the charms needed so that your crops would succeed. I mean, that was the state, and everyone was understood that if you were from that tribe or that country, oh, that meant you were that religion. And it was true. Christianity is unique in that from the very beginning, Jesus was proclaimed as the Savior of the world. The whole world. And when you get to the epistle in Ephesians, that's what Paul is talking about. And there's this wonderful kind of gee whiz, I can't believe it, sort of attitude that flows through that. Because he's saying that God has called me to, in essence, proclaim something that is without historic precedent. It is brand new that this Savior is, in fact, the Savior of the world and non-Jews, meaning most of us, Gentiles, actually are included in. And that there's no greater and lesser. But instead, we are all, in fact, under the authority of Jesus, one family. We are co-heirs. We are co-equal together. And that's what is the gospel that Paul is describing, that he was there to proclaim. 
that the Gentiles, to use his language, are fellow heirs. What that means is God doesn't look down on any one of us because of ethnicity or background. That all of us are invited to stand co-equally and take our place kneeling before Jesus as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So that what we see beginning in the Isaiah reading where it talks about kings and they're not talking about Jewish kings from Saba and places like that. There's no Saba in Israel. Would come and offer their gifts but we see manifested in the coming of these wise men the same. Paul is now declaring in the epistle, it's my job to declare, in other words, what we saw in history, that this is really the gospel for the whole world, for everybody, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you're from, it doesn't matter. All of you are invited to come and to kneel before this one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So the uniqueness of Epiphany, this celebration, is that declaration that this is not a private religion. This is a religion for all people everywhere. And that's what we celebrate because we get to be included. God has made room for us. And had there not been someone somewhere in the midst of our own history, we would be worshiping something very, very, very different from the compassion, the mercy, the forgiveness, the care, the trust, and the promise of eternal life that we see in Jesus. But the second thing that's just as important, when you saw me put the star right on her chest, is the fact that Paul understood his vocation to declare this to the rest of the world. And he will go on to say in the book of Ephesians, that this isn't just his call, as if the rest of us would go, that's fine for you, have a nice life. But instead, and this is embodied in what we're going to see in the commitments that we will be making together as those who are being confirmed and reaffirmed, is that we're saying, I am willing to be a part of that missionary enterprise. I'm willing in my generation among my family, among my friends, among my neighbors, my co-workers, the people I know, the world where God has placed me, I'm willing to be available for God to use me too. That's also the message of Epiphany. So for example, in about two weeks, the collect that will show up lays that out very clearly. Give us grace to answer readily the call of our Savior. What's that call? To be available for him and for his service. In other words, Christianity in its heart is not merely the comfort that we receive and the promise of eternal life. It's also the call to service. You really can't have one without the other. We have been strengthened for a purpose. We have been forgiven for a purpose. We were included because someone sacrificially gave of their life so that our forebears would know the gospel so that we also could be included and come in, and in essence, to celebrate Epiphany, and to say yes to Jesus is to say, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. I'm willing also to say yes, to be available for God, to use me however or wherever He determines, because this is a gospel for the whole world. Remember John? Jesus says, God so loved the world, not just people like me. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's because people heard that call that you and I are right here today. So epiphany, two things. Number one, it's the declaration in history that people of all ethnic backgrounds are included at the feet of the Savior, symbolized in these non-Jewish wise men who show up to worship Jesus and to give the very best that they have. And then the second is, I'm willing to take my place and to be a part of what God is doing in the world, to be available for Him and for His service wherever He places me. That, in fact, is the essence of what it means to be confirmed, which you'll see in the promises. 
So, there's gratitude. Oh, God, thank you for bringing me in. And also commitment. Thank you for bringing me in. I give my life to you. Use me as you see fit. That is epiphany. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you that you showed in a way that was absolutely supernatural that the peoples of the earth are included in what it is that you have revealed in your Son. And that we are heirs of that wondrous proclamation. Help us, O oh Lord, in our day, by your power, by your grace, and by your mercy, to be available for you. That in our generation also, people might come to know you. The family of God might be increased. And that in it all, you might receive all of the praise and thanks and glory. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.